back in Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse 15, that we talked about last week. The groom was saying to the bride, hey, you better get up. He says the foxes are spoiling the vine. Those little foxes are spoiling the vine. And uh, in Ezekiel 13, verse three and four, if you weren't here last week, you could write this down as this reference. In Ezekiel, the Lord says to him, your prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. And so we saw last week when he's saying the foxes are spoiling the vine. We see the vine represents Israel. The foxes that are destroying Israel are the false prophets. And then also, in, I gave a reference in Matthew 7, uh, 3 through 15, or 13 through 15, where the Lord himself is speaking. And he says, beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but they're like ravening wolves. So again, we see the false prophets are likened to foxes, to wolves that want to destroy the sheep. And then we saw in uh, Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 16 and 17, after he had you know, just so beautifully was wooing her to get out of the house and work the field. Uh, she tells him, she says, my beloved is mine. In other words, Lord, you belong to me first and then I belong to you. And uh, she knew where he fed. He said he feeds among the lilies and we saw the lilies represent people. But then what she says, she says, until the day break and the shadows flee away, she says to him, turn. In other words, go take a hike. Why don't you go play and uh uh, be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. And do you remember what I said Bether meant last week? Mountain, it's the mountains of division or separation. So here he comes to her trying to woo her to come out to him and to work the harvest. And she says, you go run and play. And uh, I'm going to stay here in this nice, beautiful house. And then uh, we saw in Song of Solomon 3, verse 1 and 2 last week, the next verse was he does just that. He leaves, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, she wakes up, and she reaches out, and he's not on the bed, nowhere to be found. And so finally, she says, I'm going to get up. And three times, she says, I sought him, I sought him, I sought him, but what? Couldn't find him. He wasn't there. <clears throat> and uh, what's interesting is in uh, Hosea 5, 5 and 6, uh, well, first off, in Song of Solomon 1, 8, if you'll reference, the daughters of Jerusalem tell her when she says, you know, behold, uh, my whom my soul loves, where do you feed your flock? OK, where do you make them rest at noon? And it was the daughters of Jerusalem who responded to her. Why don't you go feed your flocks by his flocks and maybe you'll find him. And uh, in Hosea five, five through six, it gives this verse that we closed with last week where it talks about how Israel and Ephraim are going to go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He's withdrawn himself from them. And so here uh, you're going to find the whole book of Song of Solomon is tied into the book of Hosea. They're parallel. And so we find now in on page 25 here of your notes at the top in Jeremiah 29, 13, there's a verse everyone's familiar with. God says, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. The problem we saw in Song of Solomon one and two, her heart has been divided between King Solomon and the shepherd. OK, there's this warfare going on. And in Second Chronicles 15, we're not going to read this whole verse, but uh, starting at the end of verse two through verse seven, God is speaking to Asa. And then he says to all of Judah and Benjamin, he says, the Lord is with you while you are what? Well, you're with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But what happens if you forsake him? He what? He forsakes you. And then it says, for a long season, Israel's been without a, the true God, without a teaching priest, without Torah. But when they, in their trouble, did turn to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And so I think that's also prophetic of these last days when they turn back to the Lord. Right now, Israel's mostly secular. But when they turn back to the Lord, he is going to be found of them. That's the times that we're living in. And so anyway, so now we're going to find here. Uh, the Shulamite is continuing. She's speaking here in chapter three, verse three and four. She's finally left the house. She says, I'm going to get up now and I'm going to go search. And we saw last week she was searching in the broad ways and broad is the way of destruction. But all of a sudden, she says, the watchman going about the city found me. And notice here it says that she says, I, I said to the watchman, have you seen him whom my soul loves? And then it says, but a little while after I passed from them, I found him whom my soul loves. 
When she finally confessed her love before others, she found him. It was only after she made that confession of faith, because if you remember, I told you earlier in chapter one, she never confessed that she loved him. She said, that's why the virgins love you. That's why everyone else loves you. But she never said to anyone that she loved him. Finally, she confesses that she loves him and she, he is found. The other thing, this also, I believe, tells you that the shepherd is not Solomon. This is also t- because she knows where the palace is. She knows where Solomon would be. She's out hunting, searching for the shepherd whom she truly loves. And what happens typically? Now she's exhausted and she falls back asleep again. And so now the shepherd is speaking to the daughter of Jerusalem. And here you're going to find uh, the typo in almost every Bible. Some of you find in this verse, it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor wake my love till she please. In almost every Bible, it says he please. Sometimes it says it please. OK, well, it doesn't wake up. OK, now, if you might regard it, it in one sense, in the sense that um, she will love me when the right time comes, you know, in, in one sense. Uh, but basically, the translation literally is she, not he or it. And again, who falls asleep? We do. Does the Lord sleep or slumber? No. Plus, when you see the word my love, you know, he's speaking and he's speaking about her. And so now the daughters of Jerusalem declare in verse six through eight, they say, who is this that's coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all the powders of the merchant? Behold, his bed, which is Solomon's and that typical of the life of Solomon. And she says, 60 men are about of the valiant of Israel. Now, look at this. It says they all are holding swords, expert in war. Every man has a sword upon his thigh because of what? Fear in the night. We could go a long time on this verse. One of the things I want to relate to you, as you study the Bible, one of the things is look at connecting <coughs> words in Hebrew. For example, like we talked about, <coughs> sorry, about last week, when you find a word only appears twice or something like that, there's a connection. <coughs> well, if you look at Joel 2.30, God says, I'm going to show wonders in heaven and in the earth, <coughs> blood and fire and what? Pillars of smoke. The Hebrew word for pillar everywhere else is a different Hebrew word. Here, it's the same word. And here we find this is speaking of what? Judgment. <clears throat> so we find Solomon is coming and we see pillars of smoke. Now, how many of you, <clears throat> well, before I go into that, let's look at Psalm 74, 1. It says, oh, God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? The word smoke implies anger. OK, Solomon is probably angry. She's gone. She's gone after this other shepherd. He's coming out looking for her. <clears throat> now, here's what's fascinating. How many of you, when you have a fire, do you want the flames or do you want smoke? The flames are going to bring light. What is smoke going to bring? Now, does it say a pillar of smoke followed them or a cloud? It was a cloud. If you'll notice at Exodus 13, 22, it says he took away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before his people. He never took it away. What followed the Messiah is a cloud. I mean, does a cloud hurt your eyes when you're in a fog? Smoke does. OK, so here we see a difference. It's pillars of smoke that is following Solomon, not a pillar of a cloud. And the, here they had fire, no smoke, so they could see at night. So at night with the Messiah, there's a pillar of fire, but no smoke. And it was a cloud by day. It was like this big fog cloud. So there wasn't any smoke that was there. So I just want to uh, have you think about that. Think of the difference of what's going on here. What is following Solomon is a pillar of smoke, referring to anger. <clears throat> and also we see here he's here. He's jeopardizing his soldiers by doing crazy things. What is he doing out in the middle of the night? Okay, and they're having his bed. They're 60 men about it. They're carrying this bed. 
he's probably lying down sleeping and they're all what? They're terrified. They have fear in the night. <clears throat> we see in Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. It says, who among you fears the Lord, who obeys the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rest on his God. And now watch this. This is interesting. It says, behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who are surrounded with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks which you've kindled. This you shall have of my hand, but you're going to lie down in sorrow. So the wicked in times of darkness, instead of trusting in God, trust in themselves. They kindle a light for themselves to walk by or sparks, which means a flash of fire, a burning arrow. So here it's it's you think of Solomon at night. They have torches or whatever, but it's a light that's going to go out. It's not the eternal light of the Messiah. It's like he's trying to generate his own light. And what do we see in First Thessalonians five, five and six? We're to be children of Light, children of the day, were not of the night or darkness. And here we see Solomon as a man of the night. He's out in the night. And you see, can you imagine this great big monstrous bed and these guys are having to carry it on their shoulders or whatever? You know, you got 60 men. They probably got one arm carrying the bed, the other one on their shoulder with their sword ready to, you know, attack anybody who comes. In Amos 6, 3 through 6, it says, Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seed of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory. You stretch out on your couches, you eating the lambs of the flock. Instead of feeding the flock, they're fleecing the flock. Okay? Uh, They're eating them up. And calves from the midst of the stall. Who sing idly to the sound of stringed intimates and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls. But look at this. You anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but you're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. How many of us today are grieved for the affliction of Joseph? Do we see Israel gone astray? What's on our heart? Is it just, hey, I got mine. That's their problem. Or are we actually grieved for the affliction of our uh, brother Israel? The other thing that we saw in that verse, it says he has uh, all the powders of the merchant is one of the things that it said. Well, let's take a look at First Kings 10. It says that we saw here that the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666, 666 talents of gold. And it said, besides that, look what he had of the merchant men and of the traffic of the spice merchants. It was talking about myrrh and frankincense and all the powders of the merchant. And we see here about all of this. Who were his merchants that were bringing the spices and all the kings of Arabia, the governors of the country for the king had at sea a navy. He had a navy. And it was of Tarsus, which with the navy of Hiram, he was the king of Tyrus or Tyre. And look what else they were bringing apes and peacocks and silver and gold and ivory. And in Ezekiel 27, three, God says to say to Tyrus. O oh, you that are situated at the entry of the sea, which are a merchant of the people from many isles, thus saith the Lord God of Tyrus, you have said, I am perfect of beauty. And you see, it's, it's refers to Satan. And here we see Solomon had a league with him in getting the merchandise. And what were some of the merchandise? We see in Ezekiel 27, 12 and 13, going back to the Tarshish, which is the navy where Solomon had his boats. It says, Tarsus was your merchant because of the multitude of your wealth with silver, iron, tin, lead. They gave you for your wares. Javon, Tubal, Meshach were your merchants. And they traded what? The souls of men and vessels of bronze for your goods. We see in Revelation concerning Babylon. We look here about all the merchants of the earth again. And they have all of the the different gold and silver and precious stones. But go to the last verse. What do we see? They're also trading in beasts and sheep, horses, chariots and slaves. And what else? The souls of men. History repeats itself. This is the exactly what it's talking about in these last days. Now, one of the other things that I think is so fascinating. If you go back. Let's see. Oh. Yeah. All right. Now. The next verse here. Let's take a look at this. Remember in this Song of Solomon, we're talking about. The daughters of Jerusalem. Now, who did I say were the daughters of Jerusalem? Do you remember? Sodom, Samaria, the Jerusalem is the city. And then you have the suburbs all around. And I showed you in Ezekiel. Well, God says, I'm going to give you Sodom and Samaria for daughters. Okay. So now, do you think God, look at Jacob, I've loved, Esau, I hated. If if you were God, who do you love more, Jerusalem or the daughters of Jerusalem? 
Jerusalem. That's where the, the heart is. OK. And look at what this says here in Psalm 137, verse five and six. It says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I don't remember you, let my tongue cleave the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. And in Revelation 21, John sees the holy city, which is what? The new Jerusalem coming down from God. That's represented as the bride. So here we see Jerusalem is the bride. The daughters of Jerusalem are like Sodom and Gomorrah. But now look how the Shulamite responds. The daughters of Jerusalem are saying, hey, look at King Solomon coming up like a pillar of smoke. And they're all afraid of the night and everything going on. And what is her response? She says, King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom of gold, the covering of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for who? For the daughters of Jerusalem. So Solomon is more in love with the daughters of Jerusalem than Jerusalem. And then it says, so she says to this, you go forth, O daughters of Zion, you can behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals in the day of the gladness of his heart. That's not the crown I'm looking for. That's not the king I'm looking for. I'm looking for the shepherd, the Messiah as my king. What do we see in Isaiah 316? It says, moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are what? They're haughty. They walk with stretched forth necks, wanton eyes, walking in mincing as they go. But that's who Solomon loves. We see now the, the shepherd, after not only she confessed her love, she's really realizing what the Messiah means to her. And here she, you know, was telling the daughters of Jerusalem, fine, you can have Solomon. I don't want Solomon. I want the shepherd. And so now the shepherd addresses the Shulamite in response. And he says here in uh, chapter four, verse one through five, behold, you are beautiful, my love. So here we know he's talking because he's saying my love. He says, behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves from where behind your veil. Now, what does it mean in Judaism if you have a veil on? That means you're committed. OK, it's like being espoused or betrothed to someone. You may not be married yet. But you're betrothed. In other words, you're not for anyone else now uh, except for this particular person. And then he, she, he goes on. Uh, he goes on saying how your hair is like a flock of goats. But I want you to go down to where I have it underlined. Then he says to her, your lips are like what? A thread of scarlet. Your speech is becoming. So what is that thread of scarlet is referring to her speech and what she's talking about? Well, let's look at that term, the thread of scarlet. In Joshua 2, 18, here we hear about Rahab and it says, behold, we come into the land and you shall set this line of scarlet thread in the window. And then you're going to bring your father, your mother, your brothers and all in your father's house home to you and you will be safe. I can't help but think of Acts where it says, uh, confess the Lord with your mouth and you'll be saved and your house. And uh, the whole concept of the scarlet thread refers to redemption. Here she was redeemed and uh, also, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Judah and Tamar. Remember Judah and Tamar? And they had two kids. Uh, one of them was Perez or Peretz, and the other one was Zera. And uh, so here, if you remember, one of them had a scarlet thread tied on their hand. Who came out first? And uh, again, that goes back. It was from Peretz's line that Messiah came from. So here, this scarlet thread speaks of redemption as what in talking about redemption. And then in a song of Solomon's two seventeen that we had talked about a couple of weeks ago, I want to bring this out again because I'm about to show you something. It said this after he had was trying to woo her. She said, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, turn my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bether. So here she tells him until the day breaks, go take a hike. And then in the middle of the night, though, before day breaks, she wakes up. We saw she went searching all through. She confesses his love for him. He finds her. Falls asleep. And then Solomon's coming at night. So it's still nighttime. And uh, this has taken place. And then I want you to finally he responds to that statement. So we see in four six. The shepherd responds to her and he says, well, until the day break and the shadows flee away, I'll tell you where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. That refers to Mount Moriah, where all the sacrifices were done. So he says, I'm not going to go and be separated from you. I'm going to go die for you. 
He says the hill of frankincense refers to the Mount of Olives. Mount Moriah is referred to as the mountain of myrrh. So here I think it's fascinating that here she tells him to be separate. But he says until the day breaks, I tell you where I'm going. I'm going to Mount Moriah. I'm going to the Mount of Olives. I'm going to sacrifice myself for you. Now, which is which shows the true love doing it or just saying it. And you'll find all throughout the Song of Solomon, she keeps calling, referring to how much she loves him, but doesn't know where he works, doesn't know anything about him. You know, uh, and so it's a different word here. It's a different love. And uh, the shepherd continues in verse seven and eight. And he says, you are all fair, my love. There is no spot in you. If you remember, I had talked about spots, wrinkles and blemishes in Ephesians five, that God wants to present himself a bride without spot, wrinkle or blemish. And here he's saying there's no spot in you. But then he says this. Come with me from Lebanon. So where has she been? In Lebanon. Right. And there's the first time he calls her my spouse. So here we see that veil again, symbolizing she's becoming betrothed to him. And he says uh, from Lebanon, from the top of Amana, and then it's from the top of Shinir and Hermon. And then he says this from the lion's dens and from the mountains of the leopards. Well, let's look at some interesting things. In First Kings 7, 1 and 2, we see Solomon built a house of the forest of Lebanon. So that's where she's been in Solomon's house. And he's saying, I want you to get out of Lebanon. OK, I want you to come get away from there. And in Hosea 13, verse four through seven, look at what it says here. He says, yet I am the Lord, your God from the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no savior besides me. I have known you in the wilderness, in the land of great dryness, according to their pasture. So were they filled. They were filled and their heart was lifted up. If you remember, when I was talking about Solomon himself, how his heart was lifted up. And that's also what happened to Israel. And it says, what happens when your heart gets lifted up and when you get fat and lazy? It says, therefore, they have what? Forgotten me. But then look what he says. Because they forgot me, I'm going to be as a lion and as a leopard. And I'm going to watch them. So here we see in the Song of Solomon, the lion and the leopard. And the Messiah is going to be as a lion and a leopard and watch them. And what does it go on to say? Then it says this. And there I will devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Then he says, oh, Israel, but you have destroyed yourself. But in me is your help. And then look, where is your king now? A direct reference to Solomon. That he may save you in all your cities and your judges of whom you said, give me a king and a ruler. And then he says, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. So, again, it's showing you he's. God wanted to always be their king. And then the shepherd continues in verse nine through 15, and he says to her, you've ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You've ravished my heart with just one of your eyes, with one chain of your neck. How fair is your love, my sister, my bride? How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils and all manner of spices? See, again, she was consumed with the spices. He was consumed with her. And he, then he says, your lips will my bride drop as the honeycomb, honey and milk are under your tongue. And we know Torah always refers to honey and milk refer to Torah. And it's her tongue, what she speaks. And he says, the smell of your garments are like the smell of Lebanon. But now here's the key here. But look what he says. He says, you're a garden that's all shut up. My sister, my bride, you're a spring shut up. You're a fountain that is sealed. What's the difference between a well and a cistern? The well has flowing water. The cistern is just thing that contains water. But what happens? It just stagnates. And so what he's saying, you're wonderful, you're beautiful. But guess what? Nothing's flowing out. He says, your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with precious fruits, henna with uh, spikenard plants, spikenard and saffron, columnus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh, aloes, with all the chief spices. You're a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and flowing streams from Lebanon. But what? You've, it's all sealed up. And so what does she say? So then she responds in verse 16. She says, awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon what? But whose garden is it? It's his garden. And and so she still has this concept. Well, this is my garden. And and then all of a sudden she corrects it was first. He says, blow upon my garden that the spices may flow out. And then she says, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his precious fruits. In other words, now she's finally realizing, okay, this I still have this mindset. This is my garden, but it's not my garden. It's his garden and it's his fruit. We talked about last week, the fruits of the spirit. Are they our fruit or his fruits? 
his fruit. So you're going to see this whole book, the Song of Solomon, uh, is very typical prophetically of what has gone on over the last several thousand years. So we'll look at this again next week. The worship team will come up. But I don't know if you guys have ever seen Song of Solomon's story like this before. It's probably a little bit different than what you may have heard. But doesn't this make more sense when you're just comparing Scripture to Scripture and you're looking at what it's saying? But God wants us to love him for who he is, not love him for all the blessings. Amen. Amen. How many of us have been blessed by the Lord? I mean, doesn't he deserve our. Amen. Amen. Our praise and honor. So let's stand. We'll close with the word of prayer. We thank you, uh, Lord Yeshua. You truly have blessed us with uh, not only all spiritual blessings, but all physical blessings as well. You love us so much. And all you want is for us not to be consumed with the things you gave us, but to thank you and to bless you and to be consumed with you. So, Father, I just pray right now that each and every person here they would begin to just let go of the things of this world. They would not be like Esau, a man of the field or a, a one of the world. But, Father, we would hold on to things lightly here. We see a great shaking is about to come. And, Father, uh, right now, too, I forgot necessarily to pray for Israel, and I want to pray for Israel right now as well, as this great shaking is coming. Father, we just lift your son, your firstborn, up to you. We know how much you love your son and daughter, Israel. And Father, we just pray right now that you would touch them mightily, that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would come into that saving relationship with you. Father, that they would uh, just fall in love with you all over again. Father, that they would not rely upon America or any nation for uh, their salvation, but they would rely upon you. Father, as the earth is going to begin to shake and to tremble and as uh, nations begin to fall. And uh, Father, as you begin to bring judgment, we pray, Lord, that your children, Israel, would truly begin to look to you for their help. Father, protect them, protect your children, Father, even as uh, many nations are coming together to divide your nation. Father, we pray for divine protection. Father, humble us. Father, that uh, we would, not only just as a nation, but as a people, that we would truly walk with you. You said in your word that you've shown us what is good, but to to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly with your God. So we have a humble God we're walking with. So, Father, we just ask right now that you would work also within each one of us to have your heart and our eyes fixed on you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.